Hey guys, Mr. Klein here with our lesson on the laws of thermodynamics. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about the three laws of thermodynamics. These are the laws that govern what happens when energy is transferred through heat. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So what you're seeing here are steam engines. And I know when you think of steam engines, you think of train. But when we talk about a steam engine, we're actually talking about a device that uses steam in order to do work. And when it comes to the state of Louisiana, steam engines are important because in our history and even today, sugarcane mills use steam engines in order to power the refining process. And laws concerning energy conservation and energy transformations were explored in the past, but some scientists and early engineers in the 1700s began to put this to the frame of reference in terms of the work that can be done by the transfer of thermal energy to different objects, particularly in the quest to improve the efficiency of, you guessed it, steam engines. The quest by scientists and engineers blew open whenever a French engineer by the name of Nicolas Carnot, that's this guy, he determined the maximum theoretical efficiency of a steam engine mathematically. In the process, he formed the initial ideas behind thermodynamics, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Thermodynamics is a study of the movement of thermal energy, so it's heat transfer and it's application of thermal energy in order to do work. So let's go ahead and let's add this to our graphic org. Organizer. Let's define thermodynamics. It's the study of the movement of thermal energy to do work. And in our next section, we're going to go back to engines and steam engines, and we're going to talk about the concept that Carnot used in determining the beginnings of thermodynamics, and that's looking at what are heat engines. So in Carnot's studies, he used a steam engine as an example of the movement of thermal energy. A steam engine is a good example of what we call a heat engine, or any system that uses the movement of thermal energy, so heat transfer, to do work. And whenever we talk about heat engines, yes, even today, we can talk about car engines, because they use the concepts of thermodynamics in order to use energy inside the piston, where you have the compression and the combustion and the exhaust, and all of that movement of gases and movement of thermal energy causes the work to be done. But in our example, we're going to talk about a really simple heat engine. It's a heat engine that moves a piston, like you just saw in the automobile engine, through the transfer of thermal energy between a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. So you have two pools of energy. So if we look at it like this, if you warm up the gas inside the piston, it increases, and then when you move it to the cold source of energy, the heat gets transferred to that, what we call the heat sink, the cool area, which allows it to compress again. So like I was saying, let's break this down here. As the thermal energy travels through the piston, the fluid inside, what it does is it expands due to the increased energy. And as a result of this expansion, it lifted the piston upward. Now, when the energy is done passing through or it gets transferred to that cold reservoir, the piston is lowered by the reduced pressure. So let's go ahead and let's add heat engines to our graphic organizer right here. So remember, heat engines are just devices that use the transfer of thermal energy in order to do work, which is what thermodynamics is. And for the rest of this lesson, including our next section, we're going to go into the three laws of thermodynamics and how we see them in nature. The first law of thermodynamics is an explanation of the law of conservation of energy through the perspective of the movement of thermal energy. So in other words, whenever you have work and energy, the energy is transferred to work, no energy is created or destroyed in the process of the work being done. So in thermodynamic cycles, any change in the thermal energy in the system is equivalent to the amount of work that's done. If we look at our heat engine right here, as you can see, the amount of heat brought into it is equal to the amount of work done. And you see that adiabatic term. We're going to talk about that in a second because it's a really important real life aspect of the first law of thermodynamics. So let's define it right here in our graphic organizer. The total change in thermal energy is equal to the amount of work done by the object. As I was saying about the adiabatic processes, it's an important component to understand when we talk about the first law of thermodynamics because we see it a lot of times in nature. It's the change of an object without a change in the total thermal energy. And before we get into that, oftentimes we see it with gases. And so if you 
you remember Charles's law, you know, V is directly proportional to T, or remember the volume divided by the temperature at the beginning of the observation and there's a change is equal to the volume divided by the temperature afterward, okay? In other words, volume is directly proportional to temperature, so you're gonna keep that ratio. A colleague of Charles developing it was Gay-Lussac, and he developed a law that kind of runs along the exact same lines. Gay-Lussac's law says that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. In other words, it's the exact same thing as Charles's law because we're looking at pressure and volume. P is directly proportional to T, like I said, or the initial pressure divided by the initial temperature is equivalent to the final pressure divided by the final temperature. This is what we're talking about with Gay-Lussac's law. If you look right here, what I have is I have a cylinder with a fluid in it. Okay, so the pressure is one atmosphere to temperature is 300 Kelvin. Let's say I double the pressure. Okay, so I push down on the piston. Okay, I reduced it to half the size. I doubled the pressure. It's up to two atmospheres because of Gay-Lussac's law saying that pressure is proportional to temperature. I doubled the pressure, so I doubled the temperature. It's now up to 600 Kelvin. And that's essentially an adiabatic process. There's no change in the total amount of thermal energy. It's just that the thermal energy has been compressed into a smaller space. So we see this in nature when air masses, parcels, ascend or descend quickly. What ends up happening is the air pressure changes, causing a change in temperature. So we can look at it right here in this highly realistic image of a mountain range. So what happens is you have a chunk of air that goes up a parcel. As it moves up, the air pressure decreases, and as a result, the temperature increases. I'm sorry, decreases. So once it gets to the top of the mountain, oftentimes it'll rush downward. And in the process of it rushing downward, this parcel of air hasn't gained mass. What's happening though is it gets lower into the atmosphere, the air pressure is gonna increase. The result of the air pressure increasing is the temperature increasing. So what ends up happening is you can have air masses descending down slopes, gaining dozens of degrees through this adiabatic process. Why? Because no energy is added to the system, the temperature rises the result of an increase in air pressure pressure instead of an increase in total energy. We see the opposite if you've ever deflated a tire. What ends up happening is whenever you deflate the tire, that sudden decrease in pressure means there's a sudden decrease in temperature. And so in the west of the Rocky Mountains, they're sometimes called Chinook winds, and this is the Chinook wind descending off of the mountain. It's like a shelf cloud. In places in Europe, or the proper meteorological term, it's called fun winds. So let's go ahead and let's add adiabatic processes to our graphic organizer. It's pro their process is where there's no change in total thermal energy, but you get a change in temperature or the change in the system through something else. And in our next section, we're going to talk about what happens when there's changes whenever we talk about the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is concerned with the flow of energy within the system. The law states that over time, the amount of order in the system, what will end up happening to it, it'll either stay constant or steady state, or it'll decrease to the point where there is total disorder. And we see this in real life all the time. I mean, I know you guys are just like me. I mean, you clean up your desk and it looks perfect. I mean, look at how amazingly clean and well-ordered this is. And you start dealing with real life and the next thing you know, your desk looks just like this. It, over time, the energy in a system moves from order to disorder until it reaches zero. And this zero is what we're going to be talking about here. We can measure the amount of disorder in the system. And this is what we know as entropy. Entropy is an important concept because it realizes the concept that that not all energy in an energy transfer is converted to work. Okay, remember energy is the ability to do work or cause change. So not all of it is converted directly to work, but it's converted to something else. So we consider it wasted. Okay, so whenever we talk about entropy, I mean, it goes from order to disorder. I mean, this is why we don't teach our children entropy until you're in junior high and high school. So let's add this to our graphic organizer. Entropy is the amount of disorder in a system. So what I was talking about is this energy is wasted. It's converted usually to waste heat or sound or light or something like that. So what ends up happening is if you recycle the energy that was used to work back into the system, in other words, you convert it back to the beginning, you make like a loop of this energy. What will end up happening is you'll have energy being wasted, it'll be converted to waste heat, and over time the total available energy to be able to do the process of work will become zero. And whenever we talk about systems, it's like anything and being used in a process, and we can actually stretch this out to the universe. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, we follow it to its logical conclusion, is that sooner or later, the entire universe will run out of useful energy, and it'll be a cold, dark place. 
We call this the heat death of the universe. Now, I know I kind of am on a downer here, but don't worry. Uh, according to scientists, we figured it's theoretical at this point, but it's about 10 to the 1,000 years from now, theoretically, that the uh, heat death of the universe would occur. So, you know, we got a good long time to go until then. So what we're going to do in our next section is we're going to go up on a high note, and we're going to talk about the third law of thermodynamics. The first two laws of thermodynamics are important because of their applications in engineering and the understanding of heat transfer. So we know that the total energy in the system is going to stay the same when there's a transfer, but what's going to end up happening is you're going to lose it in the whole work energy relationship. The third law makes the connection between entropy and heat transfer. The third law of thermodynamics states this, that as the temperature of the system, what it does is if it approaches absolute zero, the amount of entropy will decrease as well. So we look at this in terms of a trend. Now this is not drawn to scale, this graph I'm gonna show you. So the y-axis is temperature in kelvins because we're dealing with absolute temperatures. And then the x-axis is the amount of entropy. As the temperature drops down in kelvins to zero, the amount of entropy will be reduced as well. Now, this is kind of a common sense thing, after all, if you know the kinetic theory of matter. Is at absolute zero, there is no particle movement. So they're not moving at all because, so as a result, if there's no movement, there's no opportunity for heat to be transferred. If there's no opportunity for heat to be transferred, there's never an opportunity for it to be wasted. Therefore, there's no entropy in the system. Since we know that absolute zero is theoretical, entropy is always present in real life applications. So let's go ahead and let's wrap up our graphic organizer here and let's wrap up our video. The third law of thermodynamics says this, that the entropy decreases with the total amount of thermal energy in the system. You get down to absolute zero, there's no entropy. We're talking about thermodynamics. It's the study of movement of thermal energy to do work. And it mainly concerns in the beginning the idea of heat engines or using thermal energy to do work. So the first law is that the total change in the thermal energy is equal to the amount of work done. The second law law says over time this energy moves from order to disorder becomes unusable until the total amount of energy reaches zero because it's all waste heat and we can't put it to work. And of course, the third law says that this concept of disorder, entropy, decreases with the total amount of thermal energy in the system. So there you go. That's the lesson on thermodynamics. I hope you learned something. And if, and as always, you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for watching. <laughs>